Maria, it is such a joy for me to be able to spend time with you while you're here. Looking forward to your lecture. And um, just, I feel so honored to be able to be spending this time asking you some questions. So, you know, why don't you just sort of share a little bit about your journey to Smith? How did you get here? What made you come? Um, I initially never thought of being in academia. I was, I started out as a clinician. I got my master's at Columbia when it was very psychoanalytic, psychodynamic, and that was the culture there that um, people were often in their own therapy as part of learning how to do this work and, you know, which, which is also typical in the psychoanalytic training institutes that you go through a training analysis. And so um, I knew very early on that I wanted to work, you know, in behavioral health and all of my focus was, was behavioral health, mental health, uh, therapy. Um, my first, well, both of my field placements, I, I had the opportunity to work with both adults and children, which was ideal. Mm. Yeah. What I love is how you found your way here by listening to people who are important in your life. I was doing a presentation um, and this was at uh, what's now called Sitting Bull Tribal College. It's uh, on the Standing Rock Reservation in North and South Dakota and one of our elders came up after the presentation and said to me, that was really good. You need to get your PhD. Huh. She said, and her, she's a nurse. Her name is Bertha Gipp. And I'll always remember that. And that just, that just planted the seed in my head. I had never thought about going on for a PhD. Mm -hmm. And that was the first sign. And then, I, so I started thinking about it. And then I saw um, an ad for Smith in an NASW newspaper. And it also caught my eye. And then it talked about Smith having an anti-racist policy. Mm -hmm. I think I had also some intuitive sort of things going on too or just synergistic mm -hmm. pieces because I didn't realize until I got to Smith um, and they started, you know, talking about the history of the school and classes mm -hmm. that Smith was a trauma school. Right. And so it was founded to initially to work with war neurosis, to train mm -hmm. providers to work with war neurosis. Mm -hmm. And I just thought this is this is pretty uncanny because my area is historical trauma and unres unresolved uh -huh. grief for uh -huh. Native people. So right. it was just a, it's a perfect fit. And Absolutely. in the first within the first two weeks, um, Dr. Roger Miller, who was at that time Absolutely. the director of the doctoral program, yeah. and um, was asking asking us to meet with him mm -hmm. and to talk with him about what our interests were in thinking about our dissertations, what we were going to do. Right. So I talked to him about my historical trauma work and, and you know, developing an intervention, want to develop an intervention more fully. And that's when um, he said, well, you could do that for your dissertation. You could do a kind of a pretest, post-test design of the effectiveness. And I was like, yes, nice. thank you. That's Absolutely. perfect. Absolutely perfect. So I knew that there was this, this synergy and Smith was the place mm -hmm. that, that was exactly where I was supposed to be. Yeah, nice. And um, so that was very su much supported. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, when you were talking about um, the work you had done before you came to Smith, right after your master's, I think that the way you started building your appreciation even for not only the psychoanalytic work you did but for the social work you did is also really important it's an important thread that you carry with you like some of your stories about like your first assessment and um, home visits I think are so yeah. valuable yeah I know what I was sharing with you before was uh, my first so I was about 21 years old my first um, home visit mm -hmm. and my first year of field placement was at a community, it was an outpatient community mental health center that had been part of a settlement house originally mm -hmm. was its origins and mm -hmm. 
and it was in um, Spanish Harlem. And it was just an amazing experience. The community was so warm and embracing. And but my first my first home visit was in a half abandoned fifth floor walk up mm. building, mm. and I was you know very green. Mm -hmm. And it, I was visiting a, a woman who was schizophrenic and stable on her meds, and her daughter had been taken away but reunited with her. Okay. And so I was also working with her daughter. So this is my very first home visit. And, and you were how old, 21? I was about 21, <laughs> and then I was, I was, my two biggest fears were junkies and rats. <laughs> I was like, I didn't want to run into either. So I thought if I stomp up the steps that, you know, I'll scare them off. And so, but, but my plan was foiled because Every second or third step was all rotted out. Oh my god! Big holes in the step, oh. and so I just I made it up to the top because she lived on the fifth floor, and she opened the door and she was pretty flat from her medication, but she was mm -hmm. stable. Mm -hmm. And then she um, she asked me if I wanted something to eat, and as she was asking me, which mm -hmm. I wouldn't have accepted anyway in terms of just the professionalism right but that's the one thing that we remember yeah Never. boundaries boundaries right <laughs> right so she open as she opens her refrigerator door uh, roaches are crawling uh, all uh, over the food uh, inside there it's just roach infested and mm. i said oh no thank you <laughs> i think i took a glass of water though to yes. be you know appropriate absolutely then, so we talked and then um when our session was over she said that she said i'll watch for you while you go until you get out the door wow. because from her landing right outside her door mm -hmm. she could look down uh, and see the door absolutely and i was just so touched by that yeah. i was like and that was yeah. the metaphor for the community that mm. that the people in the community knew who all the columbia students were even mm. though many of us could have blended in with the community everybody mm. knew absolutely. and it was just amazing and then that whole experience mm. and and dispelling those stereotypes that that existed at the time that yeah. well poor people and people of color don't have insight yes. they can't use inside oriented therapy and that was so not my experience mm -hmm. uh, you know it was just i had kids i had ex gang member come twice a week and mm -hmm. sit and talk a 14 wow. year old wow. and was getting better yes absolutely you know, so absolutely i was just excited but I got involved mm -hmm. with then psychoanalytic training mm -hmm. because at that center where I was working a lot of people were involved with psychoanalytic training mm -hmm. and so they what they did was um, I was talking to them and I, and I was encouraged by it because I felt like you're getting t deeper to the root mm -hmm. of the problem you know and you're not putting on band-aids and sometimes I felt like because you have so many people to see that you only have a chance to sort of do crisis management and kind of put band-aids on and mm -hmm. kind of just keep them from you know falling apart Absolutely. and keep them functioning but you're not getting at what's underneath all of this mm -hmm. so I started the psychoanalytic training institute mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that was really a po that's a powerful experience that is great yeah I think also what you were really highlighting is dispelling the myth that you can't work with individuals who have significant um, uh, social emotional needs because they're on such a low scale with Maslow's hierarchy of needs that you just have to keep addressing those basic needs and you're like no that's not true yeah individuals you know once those needs are met or even if they're not met in the way we think they should be you can still do some very valuable work with there yeah and yeah, it's funny that you brought that up because a lot of uh, times I'm joking around with my colleagues in the Takini network which mm -hmm. I know we'll talk, talk more about that but mm -hmm. we say that sometimes we feel like we're operating at multiple levels of that exactly. hierarchy so yes. we're very like altruistic on the top mm -hmm. but we're dealing with basic needs because there's no Absolutely. grant money and we're trying to survive and yep. you know so it's yeah yeah i think one can one can travel up and down that That's right sort of pyramid yeah nice 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 yeah. 
So do you want to say anything about your first um, assessment that you did? I'm not sure about the first one, but just at, my, at the clinic where I was, it was very, the structure was pretty, um, pretty, it was pretty rigid that we had 45 minutes mm -hmm. and we had to do a psychosocial history and come up with a diagnosis and a mini, do a mini mental status exam in 45 minutes. Uh -huh. <laughs> wow. Is, a lot. Yes, which yeah. is a lot. Uh -huh. So, and I must have done thousands of intakes. So I got good at it. I yeah. got good at honing the, it was almost like intuitive knowledge or intuitive skills of being able mm -hmm. to recognize there were certain clues and of course at that time it was the diagnostic statistical manual too which yes. was only about that thick uh -huh, so it wasn't uh -huh. as complicated as now yeah. but um and it was more classical it, it sort of went more along classical lines mm -hmm. and you know like Fenichel's writings about the you know mm -hmm. different kinds of personality disorders Absolutely. and personality characteristics and things like that but yeah. So I managed I managed to do that, but mm -hmm. we, we had to that was just the way it was. We had to do it. Mm -hmm. So again that that sort of practice wisdom that evolves and and using your intuition. Absolutely. I remember one gentleman and I hadn't mentioned this to you before that mm -hmm. came in and so it got to forty minutes and everything sort of checked out, but I just had this feeling like mm -hmm. something's going on. You know, there's something I ha I wasn't sure what diagnosis to put. Mm -hmm. And so I said, but I just had this uncomfortable feeling. So I said, so can you tell me again why you're coming in now? You know, because you think about there's precipitating factors or you mm -hmm. look for um, people whose symptoms are recent and then how long they've had their symptoms and all of that so that wasn't we weren't getting that information mm -hmm. before that so so when I asked him that he said because God told me to come in and I'm Jesus Christ mm -hmm. I was like there it is <laughs> I knew I knew and and so all his delusions started yep. coming out in the last five minutes Wow and I was so glad that I followed my intuitive, my gut sense Absolutely. that something else was going on. Right, right. Because he was able to hold it together for 40 minutes mm -hmm. and not be psychotic and not mm -hmm. show that he had a thought disorder. Yeah. So I often would tell students that story to say, you know, develop your intuitive skills and your sense and you start exactly. observing, pay attention to what feelings come up because they're clues, they will tell you things. I remember another case mm -hmm. where I was, it was like in a, in a therapy group, and um, the person, the individual was, was talking and starting to talk about a conflict with the, his fiance, and all of a sudden I started craving pizza, <laughs> just out of the blue. Mm -hmm. I just started craving pizza, and what what you learn is you have this sort of hovering attention, you know, with the psychoanalytic mm -hmm. work that you. You pay attention to where your mind goes and what associations huh. you have while you're paying attention to the person, and huh. and so it, it, it's a it's a very rich and complex thing to do. Yeah. So I just observed. I said, "Why am I craving pizza?" Mm -hmm. And so as he kept talking, then he starts describing an argument with his fiance over microwaving pizza but oh this was gosh. after i was having the wow. craving wow so i was picking up this unconscious Absolutely. content yeah that's like crazy yeah that's cool <laughs> that's so cool yeah so um so this was your you know a really rich clinical foundation that you had and mm -hmm. then you started thinking about teaching how did that grow out of? Actually, yeah. it was when in the doctoral program, um, we talked about one of the things that we read was a book on how to complete and survive a doctoral mm -hmm. dissertation. Absolutely, I remember I that. I don't remember one. the author, right. if I have the title exactly correct. And uh -huh. one of the things that they said in the book was some of the best jobs when you're ABD and you know, all mm -hmm. about dissertation are in academia because um, of the culture of academia to write and also the fact that sometimes you can teach courses in the area that, you're dis that matches with your dissertation yep. research or, or to try to do that. Mm -hmm. 
So that was, that was one of the things that, that I thought, well, hey, that'd be interesting. And then I got a um, Council on Social Work Education Minority Fellow, Doctoral Fellowship. Mm -hmm. And they brought us, one, one year they brought us in to the, the CSWE meetings mm -hmm. and they provided kind of mentoring sessions and mm -hmm. orientation mm -hmm. sessions to academia. And, and so I still was like, oh, I don't know if I want to actually become a faculty mm -hmm. member, but I thought maybe of teaching on the side or something, and, but doing yeah. full-time clinical practice and working with tribes. And, and so then um, as you know, the, it went on, people started recruiting me. Mm. I said I wasn't, I wasn't done yet, but I had, I was um, close to finishing the, the dissertation mm -hmm. work. And so they started recruiting me. And so I went, I was invited to come to campus. And then mm. they, one of them said, well, we just want you to present. Yeah. And, and then, you know, if you want to interview, we'll, mm. you know, we'll interview you. And, but they wanted, they did want to interview me. So it just sort of opened up another window, mm -hmm. and then all of this, the things that were going on and talking about it. And I yeah. thought, wow, this might be a good way to get my work done with the historical trauma work. Yeah, absolutely. What sort of piqued your interest in starting to do historical trauma work? Um, back in the 70s, I just remembered I was, uh, that was when I was at Columbia. I was just finishing, uh, finishing school there and uh, checking into the psychoanalytic training institutes there to, to, you know, to get started. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, I was looking at, it was just uh, one day that I sat and was looking at some historical photographs in mm -hmm. my apartment and mm -hmm. I just started sobbing. You know, and I just got the sense of overwhelming grief, and it felt like it was huge, like it wasn't my personal grief, yeah. that it was something that was generational. And mm -hmm. so, um, and I, so I paid attention to that, that I felt like I was carrying something, carrying mm -hmm. this grief and this trauma of our ancestors. Yeah. And so then after, after that, I started to um, just pay, pay, pay attention to that. And then at the Psychoanalytic Institute, Training Institute, I met a child of Holocaust survivors. Mm -hmm. And that's also when Helen Epstein's book came out that was around 1976, okay. uh, Children of the Holocaust, mm -hmm. which was really a qualitative study of the experiences of children of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And I started hearing more about that, and that just really resonated for me. And I thought about the American Indian Holocaust, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in a sense, and um, and started developing more, more and more kind of allies. And and I just remember my training analyst just happened to be Jewish, huh. and one time I was talking about something, and he got it because he said. Yeah. And because it, it was it was something personal and native mm -hmm. specific, and he said, mm -hmm. "That's genocide." And I was like, "Yes, mm. thank you for." Absolutely. He acknowledged it. Absolutely, and he got it. it. Yes. Yeah, and I yeah. felt like he understood. Yeah, he understood, and mm -hmm. so that was really encouraging Very too. Very powerful. Yeah, so yeah. I felt like I could keep keep on this that I was on to something mm -hmm. that could help. Yeah, help our people. So I started integrating it in you know, working with in clinical practice and kind of taking that lens and and then also in, in presentations I was doing and group groups I was running and absolutely and just developing it and building that and right. workshops. Uh, something that runs through your narrative a lot is your um, your ability to really reflect on your internal process. Mm -hmm. And your dreams are really important to you as well. I yeah, know. and you shared some of those yeah. that helped inform. Yeah, I had a dream as a child that uh, later, as an adult, was interpreted by one of our healers, and the, it was a dream about an elephant. Mm -hmm. That in my dream, the elephant had escaped from the circus, and mm -hmm. and I think I was probably about six years old, and 
And so, and it was, it was like dark and raining and all of a sudden this elephant is, is like running and I'm like, <laughs> you know, wide eyed just standing there like, what do I do? And what I do in the dream is I just put my arms out mm. like mm. to welcome that elephant. Uh -huh. And then it, like the elephant jumps into oh. my arms but then turns into like a little, a little kitten. Mm. Huh. And when I was telling uh, that dream to the healer, he said that was about kind of embracing the real ancient huh. ways and the ancient traditions. And mm -hmm. because I had another dream later about an elephant who was drowning mm -hmm. and a whole group of us. And this dream was, was by, um, was 1992. Okay. And then all of us that had been involved with the first historical trauma and unresolved grief intervention, the mm -hmm. work, which is what's my dissertation work, mm -hmm. we were all, um, and all of us are involved in traditional ceremonies. Mm -hmm. So we were all standing around that elephant and we were um, going to that elephant to pray for that elephant. Mm -hmm. And um, that that was, you know, again, so those were those were really connected with Absolutely. what I was what I was told. So yeah, wow, it's yeah, really powerful. Yeah, I think really really powerful. So um, <clears throat> so that's what also you were referring to as the Takini Network, I believe. Is mm -hmm. that right? The training that you did with those facilitators. Yes. Yeah, so in in 1992, which is when I did the actual dissertation workshop, we had two things. That one was the training of the trainers. Mm -hmm for to prepare for delivering it to a larger group mm -hmm. and then uh, followed up within a few weeks by the full intervention with 45 oh. that was the 45 people okay the involved and so what I did was I recruited all my all my friends and relatives <laughs> to <laughs> to join me in cuz we had we trained co-facilitators so each group had a male and a female co-facilitator nice but we but also in that sort of psychoanalytic vein that um, which I really think is important is um, that if you're going to do clinical work with people you need to do your own work mm -hmm. so Absolutely. the concept of self-analysis training analysis is really important because right. otherwise your stuff can get in the way and that's not fair to the people you're working with Absolutely. so the so the model was that that we would go through our own mm -hmm training healing experience before we would deliver that so we would go through what we were asking the people to do absolutely nice. and so i had um so that's when we formed the takini network mm -hmm. and the idea was to have uh to almost form an extended family kinship network mm -hmm. and to uh to devote to working on this and working on that healing so those were the original trainers that were trained that you know that I recruited and some were a couple were clinical providers native mostly all native folks and and uh, some were traditional healers and some were uh, Bigfoot memorial riders mm -hmm. and wow. you know uh, just people who were already doing a lot of their own healing work mm -hmm. and just very committed so those became our core group nice well now, you know, sort of, um, do you think that you want to say any more just about your definition for historical trauma before we fast forward to where, what you're doing now? Yes, it's, I define it as um, mm -hmm. cumulative emotional and psychological wounding across mm -hmm. generations, including one's own lifespan, because everything up to a minute ago is history. Yes. So I... So some people misunderstand it and think that I'm only talking about the distant past Absolutely. and I'm not I'm, I'm talking about everything up to up to the present yes and including the present reality yeah you know which just happened a minute ago That's so right. the but the 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 idea was to ground it in the past in the context because mm -hmm. that destigmatizes mm -hmm. uh, for people it gives people a frame of you know like no wonder look what's happened mm -hmm. to all our people mm -hmm. all our ancestors across time that we're just carrying this on yeah. and it's affecting us and there have been horrendous things that have happened and mm -hmm. 
you know, we, we lost the right to bury our, our dead the way that we did traditionally. And those yes. were, all cultures have wisdom in, in what they, their practices mm -hmm. are, have been, that fits with their culture. Right. And right. so when you can't practice it in that way, that's one way of, of stunting the grief or trapping Absolutely. the grief. Mm -hmm. You know, we have certain beliefs that if you don't have certain ceremonies, the spirit of the person can't be released and will be mm -hmm. trapped, you know, on this earth um, yeah. or that other things could happen. And so not being able to do that, um, being survivors of, of massacres, you know, like the Wounded Knee Massacre mm -hmm. and the mass graves where those ceremonies couldn't be performed at that time. Right. Um, those are things that affect people and that this, the grief and the trauma just gets carried on and on. Mm -hmm. So there are ways to heal with that, from that both, in, both traditionally in traditional culture, mm -hmm. but also um, incorporating what we know now about healing and alcoholism and trauma Absolutely. and PTSD and complex or grief, mm -hmm. complicated grief or prolonged grief and yeah. all of this knowledge that we've gained over many years so mm -hmm. that's that's the idea and in my experience with uh, the evaluation and research we've been doing with this is that people at least perceive that as being helpful the historical yeah. trauma concept absolutely and they start to feel this release of mm -hmm pressure and like, oh no, no wonder I feel this way. Exactly. And one, one individual I know that um, is more of an elder stated that um, and had been in outpatient behavioral health treatment for, mm. for many years said that mm. no one ever asked her about her boarding school trauma and oh. she was never yeah. able to talk about it until she started doing the, the historical mm. trauma work. Nice. And that she really felt like this weight had been lifted off of her. Absolutely. Sort of like cathartic. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Well, so fast forward as to what you're doing now. So currently, I have a National Institute of Mental Health grant. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've been progressing and moving forward. And that's been a, that's been a, dream of mine mm -hmm. too which I have a little story about that I'll tell you I'll come back to it in a minute but um, so that is looking at taking the historical trauma and unresolved grief intervention which has been recognized as a tribal best practice mm -hmm. by uh, SAMHSA the Substance Abuse and Mental Absolutely. Health Services Administration in conjunction with First Nations Behavioral Health Association huh. um, Great. so Taking, taking the intervention um, and combining it with group interpersonal psychotherapy, which um, I think is, it focuses on the sort of the relational issues around depression and depression triggers. So mm -hmm. role, you know, conflict with another person or your role or um, grief and loss and, um, you know those kinds of issues that get interwoven then into the the model so mm -hmm. not seeing it not not saying that people who have depression may not have a biochemical aspect to it and may need medication and there's been studies where sometimes medication and the treatment work really well absolutely so um, so this study is combining both of those models Mm -hmm. And because that IPT is something that NIMH has funded in the past, mm -hmm. and um, and I have some colleagues from Columbia who are consultants on that, who are IPT experts. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what's going on. So we're taking yeah. the historical trauma intervention, combining it with the group interpersonal psychotherapy, and then randomly assigning people to the two groups. So one okay. gets just the IPT only, and the mm -hmm. one gets the enhanced historical trauma mm -hmm. group. And then the, the goal is to later to do more with you know, a larger study where you can have more sites and so maybe do something with perhaps just the historical trauma only and one with the combined with the IPT and you know, other mm -hmm. kinds of 
arrangements sure. like that. Yeah. Great, and great. So that we're we're finding we don't have um, we collected the data on the first wave, but we're okay. still doing some follow-up data collection. Yeah. So we don't have all of that analyzed, so we don't know okay. the, what the, uh, the data forms will show, mm -hmm. but we do know that what is being expressed by the people who have stayed in the groups is really positive, that nice. they feel that this has really helped them. Yeah. And yeah. Very good. So that's good. So that's yeah. what you're busy doing now. Yeah. Nice. Well, Maria, it was such a joy to catch up with you, and I feel so honored to have been able to sit with you the last couple of days. So thank you. So thank yeah. you.